Whenever you form a new memory, whether it's from learning a new fact or having a new experience, your brain has to make new connections. And I really don't mean that metaphorically. Neurons in your brain have to form new connections between them or at least change the strength of existing connections in order to store new information. And that process is called synaptic plasticity. Now in this video, we are actually going to be talking about a neurotransmitter called glutamate and how uh, the receptors for glutamate work. But what this is going to tell us is how the brain actually changes the strength of those connections, how you can actually get synaptic plasticity to occur, at least through one mechanism that we'll talk about. Hey, if we haven't met yet, I am Andrew and this is Sense of Mind. This channel is all about helping you understand your brain so you can upgrade your mind and improve your life. It's all about giving you fundamental knowledge about neuroscience as well as psychology and other areas in the study of the mind and brain um, to allow you to incorporate that knowledge and then make better decisions about how to best live your life. So like I mentioned, this is part of, of our Introduction to Neuroscience series, but I'll also be releasing videos that are less technical and don't really talk much about neuroscience, or if they do, it'll be in a non-technical, very digestible way. And those videos are more aimed at kind of giving you direct um, advice or just my own experience about um, improving your life, you know, increasing your well-being, allowing you to live a better life. So we really want to tackle it from both the fundamental basic science um, that will give you an understanding of the brain and then try to come in from the other side with, um, you know, life hacks, life tips, things that will help you just live happier. So if you don't want to miss any of that, please hit the subscribe button below this video or the follow um, button if you're on Instagram and like and um, just don't forget to check in frequently and see what we've got. Um, also, please be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and um, join the newsletter. We will be getting that going very soon and that will have news and information and kind of a roundup of the best of the week. Um, so check out all that. Now, this video is also part of a larger series, a introduction to neuroscience, and you may have seen some of those videos before. So if you need an introduction to uh, what a neuron is or what an action potential is or um, what synaptic transmission is, definitely check out those videos because they're all um, going to be pretty necessary for this current video. Now, the other thing about this series is that you may have found that we have uh, three different levels of difficulty for every topic that we cover um, around neuroscience. So we'll have a 30 second, kind of 30,000 foot overview of the, um, the topic, uh, just giving you the main points, and then a five to 15 minute video that will give you kind of a bare bones understanding of um, the processes, the topics that we're talking about and a longer video like this one that goes into depth and is the most difficult and longest of the three. So the previous topic we covered was how neurons communicate using neurotransmitters, and that is the process of synaptic transmission uh, because they're transmitting neuro, uh, neurotransmitters across the synapse. And I mentioned in that video that there are a lot of different types of neurotransmitters. There are at least seven main ones uh, that we're going to be talking about. And the way that I want to do this is because each neurotransmitter represents a different system in the brain, or at least has its own particular mechanisms and effects that make each of them uh, worthy of study in their own right, we're going to dedicate a, a video, a set of three videos, the easy, medium, hard, to each of the, um, the different types of neurotransmitters that we'll be talking about. So this first video is about glutamate, and that is the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. 
and we'll talk about what that means. But um, just so you know, upcoming videos will cover uh, GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, as well as ones you may have heard of more often, like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine or noradrenaline. Um, we'll also talk about something called substance P and a couple of others. Now, along the way, we won't just be talking about the biology and biochemistry of these compounds, but important um, psychological or physiological processes that they're involved with. So today we're talking about glutamate, but we'll also be talking about synaptic plasticity. This will help you later on in this course as we get to topics like um, brain plasticity, where we're looking at uh, how different brain regions might change their connections over time, and also with learning and memory, where synaptic plasticity really is at the center of, um, of that process. Okay, so before we talk about the actual mechanisms, I just want to give you some information about glutamate. So throughout the brain, glutamate is very important. Um, some estimates place glutamate um, at about 15 to 20% of all synapses in the brain, meaning that about 15 to 20% of the synapses have uh, receptors for glutamate. It doesn't necessarily mean that those are the only receptors. There's often um, different types of neurotransmitter receptors on a single neuron, um, but just to say that about 15 to 20% of synapses um, use glutamate in some way. So glutamate is an amino acid, and that is a, a type of um, molecule that is produced by your body. And um, so glutamate is in abundance, and it's kind of everywhere. And so uh, cells don't have to have a new way of making it. And so it kind of makes sense that glutamate would be this sort of general excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Okay, so glutamate is very common throughout the brain, but what does it do? Well, it's usually thought of as the brain's uh, primary excitatory neurotransmitter. So that basically means that it's exciting neurons, um, making them more likely to fire. So it is um, just like we talked about in the video on action potentials, it, it is the the type of neurotransmitter that will you know, allow sodium to come into the cell and make that cell more likely to fire. Now other neurotransmitters can also do that, but glutamate very often has this effect and um, it is super common throughout the brain. So it is kind of just the, um, the bread and butter, the brain's uh, excitatory bread and butter. Now I'm highlighting its excitatory ability because uh, in a, the next video, next set of videos, we will talk about GABA. And GABA is a different type of neurotransmitter. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And it's used at even more synapses throughout the brain as uh, glutamate is. So its role is to tamp down the activity of neurons and um, sort of regulate neural circuits. Um, it does a lot in the brain. It's very important. We will talk about inhibition when we talk about GABA. But just so you know, glutamate and GABA are both um, amino acids and they're both um, probably the most common neurotransmitters throughout the brain. Okay, so glutamate is just um, a single molecule. It's a neurotransmitter, but the receptors for glutamate come in a couple of different flavors. Um, we will get into those just in just a second, uh, but just know that there are these so-called ionotropic and metabotropic receptors. Okay, so let's get into how glutamate does its thing. <clears throat> okay, so what we've got here is our, um, our synapse, our two neuron circuit, uh, where we have our sending presynaptic neuron on the left and the receiving or postsynaptic neuron on the right. And between them is that little space called the synapse. So let's zoom in on this so-called glutamatergic synapse, meaning that it is a synapse that involves the, um, the uh, neurotransmitter glutamate. Okay, so here this is, um, this is just a representation of neurotransmitters being released from the postsynaptic, or sorry, from the presynaptic cell on the left, the sending cell, um, and they're floating across the synapse 
toward the uh, postsynaptic cell on the right, and the purple blobs are the glutamate, whereas the orange um, jagged thing is the receptor. Now we're going to zoom in on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so here what we're seeing is glutamate about to bind to its receptor, and in this case, we are going to cover the ionotropic receptor first. We'll go, get back to the metabotropic receptor, but for now we'll talk about the ionotropic. And again, if all of this is um, really new to you, check out either, um, we'll check out both the action potential video or just the uh, synaptic transmission video. The synaptic transmission is really um, key for this video. Okay. So what you'll notice is that unlike in our last video about um, synaptic transmission, so in this case, um, these ionotropic glutamate receptors actually have a ion channel embedded into their structure. So when they bind glutamate, what happens is it opens up that receptor and allows sodium to flow into the cell. Now, as we talked about in that last video, this causes, of course, the voltage, the membrane potential to go up because those sodiums carry an electric charge and they're entering the cell, and so they're going to raise the voltage, the membrane potential. Okay, so now we've got sodium in there. So this is all, you know, this all makes sense. We've got glutamate binding causing a postsynaptic excitatory potential. Obviously, it's simplified, but it's pretty much what's happening with these ionotropic receptors is they are uh, binding glutamate that's causing a conformational change inside of the receptor, of the, the um, sodium channel part of the receptor, and that is allowing sodium to flow in, raising the membrane potential, making the cell more likely to fire. All right. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the metabotropic receptor. So this is actually exactly like what we talked about in the synaptic transmission video. So glutamate binds to this receptor and it doesn't have its own ion channel. So what happens is the binding of glutamate triggers a, um, a chemical reaction inside the cell. That's what those red circles and that red arrow are. And that uh, it goes through sort of a cascade of chemical reactions and um, affects a nearby sodium channel, and that allows sodium to flow in, creating the same sort of result. Um, the voltage of the membrane potential, the voltage goes up, same thing, the membrane potential goes up. So the cell is more likely to fire. Now, what I mentioned earlier that uh, there's a difference between the metabotropic and ionotropic receptors, and it's not just in their structure. Metabotropic receptors can also cause a um, cause the cell to be less likely to fire. And so the way that they do that is um, certain types of receptors will uh, again bind glutamate and this will undergo a different set of chemical reactions within the cell. Uh, that's where those blue circles, the blue arrow are. And that will cause the sodium channel to be blocked. So it will be um, the neuron is less likely to fire because there's not that sodium coming in and furthermore that channel is blocked so this neuron is effectively less likely to fire. Now there are other mechanisms that metabotropic receptors can use to um, change the um, membrane potential and of course we just gave kind of a an overview of, of one of those but uh, it's just good to keep in mind that this is not the only mechanism that they can use to make the cell less likely to fire. There are other things uh, that they can do. Okay, so now um, let's, we've talked about what glutamate does in the cells. Um, let's zoom back out to that synapse. And now let's talk about something we mentioned at the beginning of the video. We talked about memory. We talked about synaptic plasticity. That is the changing of the strength of connections between two neurons. Okay, so let's once again zoom into this glutamatergic synapse and let's think about it. All right, what is one way that we could make this connection stronger? All right, think about that for a second. 
So how can we make this connection stronger? Well, one way we can do that is to add more receptors, right? That would make the postsynaptic cell more sensitive to the presynaptic cell because it would have you know, more receptors with which to sense glutamate. So it would be able to um, you know, take effectively a smaller input and, uh, and create a, a postsynaptic potential that made the cell more likely to fire. So the question is, how do we do that? How is that possible? All right, so let's zoom in again to the postsynaptic cell. And this time we're gonna get a little more specific. So this is an ionotropic glutamate receptor, right? The one we talked about first, where ions just flow in as glutamate binds. So that, um, that's what happens. But in this case, we're talking about a particular type of ionotropic receptor, the AMPA receptor. And now don't worry too much about the names. Um, it has to do with what molecules bind to these receptors, but Let's not worry about that much. So this is an AMPA glutamate receptor, an ionotropic AMPA glutamate receptor. And so what it does is what we just talked about. It allows sodium to flow in, uh, you know, raising the voltage in that little part of the dendrite. The other thing we need to talk about is this other kind of glutamate receptor. This is also an ionotropic receptor. Um, but it is the NMDA variety. So different from AMPA, this is the NMDA glutamate receptor. So what happens is after those AMPA receptors have allowed the um, sodium to flow in and the voltage of the membrane to go up, um, that voltage change, okay, combined with the NMDA receptor Binding glutamate, so those two factors put together, cause a change inside the glutamate, the NMDA glutamate receptor, that opens up its its channel, and it allows calcium in. Different ion than sodium, calcium comes in to the cell. And okay, what's calcium going to do? Well, one other thing that we have to talk about is that inside the postsynaptic neuron, inside that dendrite, there are these synaptic vesicles. That's what that, that uh, circle, the semicircle with the white um, center that the arrow's pointing to. That is a synaptic vesicle, or it's a, it's a type of vesicle. And we talked about synaptic vesicles in the uh, video on synaptic transmission. They're basically the bubbles that hold um, the neurotransmitter inside them, and then they fuse to the cell membrane when they're releasing those neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters flow out into the synapse, and um, it uses that sort of elegant mechanism of the, the vesicle membrane fusing with the cell membrane to release those neurotransmitters. Okay, so just like a synaptic vesicle holds a, a neurotransmitter, a bunch of neurotransmitters, um, a uh, there's another type of vesicle that actually holds receptors, right? And so these receptors are, are bound to these, these vesicle membranes inside the cell. And we want to get that receptor to the membrane um, so that this cell can become more sensitive, that we can strengthen that connection between these two neurons. So the calcium um, interacts with other molecules in the cell and basically undergoes this chain of chemical reactions that causes that synaptic vesicle to travel to the membrane and once again undergo this sort of um, uh, exocytosis type of thing where the membrane of the cell and the vesicle are joining and eventually what we get is a neurotransmitter receptor, an AMPA ionotropic glutamate receptor embedded into the surface of this cell. And that makes us happy because that strengthens the connection. That was our goal all along. So that is what we got. Okay, so obviously learning and memory involve a lot more than simply adding one receptor to one neuron. Um, and there are other types of changes that are involved in synaptic plasticity. 
We will talk more about that in future videos, but this gives you an idea of just one of the ways that cells can strengthen their connections. Another way actually has to do with building new dendrites altogether, so that postsynaptic cell can not only add new receptors, but add new um, projections that uh, can connect to that presynaptic cell. Um, there's other things that can go on that that presynaptic cell can uh, release more neurotransmitter. Um, so there's there's multiple mechanisms involved in changing the strength of those connections. Um, you know, you can imagine you could also remove uh, receptors if you wanted to make it less sensitive, or you could uh, remove connections if you want, or, or sorry, dendrites if you wanted it to be less sensitive. So you can move in either direction. And when we talk about uh, learning and memory and um, neuroplasticity generally, uh, we will get into those in more detail. But this gives you an understanding or at least kind of a framework to understand the molecular cellular changes that are going on uh, that are involved in forming new memories and forming those new connections. Um, now you also have uh, an understanding of glutamate and how it works in the cell. So that basically concludes this video on glutamate. And like I mentioned, we will be talking about GABA in the next set of videos. And GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. And as we move forward, um, glutamate and GABA will really be the kind of models of how all this works, how the, the um, changing of the postsynaptic membrane potential, the voltage of that receiving cell uh, changes. Uh, we, we'll, be, we'll be able to understand that, so we won't have to go into these, uh, these kinds of molecular details, at least in this way, uh, for future videos. We'll be talking about dopamine and the reward system. We'll be talking about serotonin and mood disorders. We'll also be talking about um, norepinephrine and noradrenaline and their role in the um, stress response and stress physiology. Uh, we'll talk about substance P and pain transduction. We will talk about some others. So, uh, oh, acetylcholine and uh, muscle contraction. Yeah, so there's, there's several other uh, videos coming on these neurotransmitter systems. And please let me know if you have any questions or anything that a topic that you'd like me to cover or you want to know about, um, put it in the comments below. I'm really interested to see what you guys think. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video if you got anything out of it. And also when you subscribe, hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you're notified and you don't miss anything new from Sense of Mind. Please uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and sign up for the newsletter. This channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation, and this video was written and produced by Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.